Hello, I'm Yanis Simonides. Welcome to Holy Cross Live. Today we continue with our cycle of programs videotaped on the beautiful campus of Hellenic College, Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology in Brookline, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston. Holy Cross Live is designed to introduce you to the basic teachings of Orthodox Christianity through interviews with clergy and lay theologians who currently teach here. In the book of Matthew, Christ states, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Today's program is Prayer and Fasting, Dimensions of the Spiritual Life. And our guests are His Excellency Metropolitan Dimitrios of Resthena, Distinguished Professor of Biblical Studies and Christian Origins, and Reverend Dr. Theodor Stylianopoulos, Professor of New Testament. Thank you. Thank you for Thank coming. You. Welcome. Your Excellency, how, how do we define prayer? What is prayer? What is its meaning? in the Orthodox Church? There are more than one ways to define prayer. One way is our attempt to communicate with God. Another way used by an expression used by St. Gregory the theologian is that prayer is what breath is for natural life. Mm -hmm. Another way prayer is the attempt to go beyond oneself and reach to the very other, who is the indescribable but at the same time approachable God. So there are many ways, but basically I think is communication with God. That's something that I could... Yes, yes, yes. yes. Other... I was going to say other interpretations or definitions of prayer, but rather, Father Sienopoulos, what is the meaning of prayer? The definitions and meaning, of course, overlap. Mm -hmm. When one hears a definition of prayer, for example, as yearning of the soul for the Creator, that definition also implies that every human being is created for prayer and that a person, a man or a woman or a child is incomplete without prayer because prayer is a very personal way of opening our lives to the presence of God. And those wonderful words that you quoted from the Gospel of St. Matthew, Yanni, earlier, provide that invitation to each person to open their lives to the presence of God. Of course, that statement is a profound statement uh, that invites us to the life of God communicating and having communion with Him, but also it should not be trivialized because God should not be seen as the Santa Claus that we can ask for any little thing that we happen to need. But this is a far deeper uh, invitation to join our lives, our hearts and minds with Him to understand His will and to live out His purposes in the world. And how now are the practical applications. Of course, there are two different dimensions. One is personal, very personal, private prayer, mm -hmm. and the other one is communal prayer. So let's take one at a time. How, how, what is the practice of prayer on an individual basis? Is it simply an utterance? Is it loud? Is it private? Is it just thought? Is it meditation? There are many ways that one can approach prayer. One of my favorite ways of putting it is that a child walks by walking. We learn to swim by swimming. And the best way to <laughs> pray is to start praying because the Holy Spirit is there to help us even in our inarticulate, feeble ways of seeking to pray. However, prayer, which is a gift, is also work. So a person can devote hours and study so that he may be, become, so to speak, a giant of prayer. So God accepts all of these efforts. Uh, and the important thing, of course, is to take the decision to make the resolution 
to reach out for our Father in heaven and to begin to pray to choose a particular place in a particular time that might be a kind of holy hour when we begin to pray to God. And there are many, many ways. One way is to have a prayer book, uh, to, to have a prayer book, to learn those prayers so that we have something to pray about, to pray with. Uh, we can also pray with our words, with our own words, whatever our feelings and, and needs and present them to God, pray for other people. We can also pray by reading meditative books, especially Holy Scripture. In those moments that we have inspirational passages, our hearts and minds naturally rise up to God and we can offer those thoughts in prayer. Is prayer also can be construed as positive, loving thinking of others or, or even an emptying of one's mind, the meditative process where rather than filling it with words, you either in the privacy of your home or in church or somewhere on top of a hill, you try to empty and cleanse in the hope, as you said, that it will be filled with, yeah. with, with, uh, uh, with instructions of how to proceed, so to speak. Well, prayer is co-equal with life. It's such a personal act that involves our hearts, our minds, our emotions, our daily living. And therefore, one can use images like prayer is light, prayer is heaven. But in the Psalms, prayer is also groaning and struggle with God. There's a beautiful image of Jacob wrestling with the angel of the Lord mm -hmm. and does not let the angel of the Lord leave until he is blessed by the angel of the Lord, upon which time Israel, uh, Jacob received the name Israel. And the very word Israel in Hebrew means one who strives with God. So prayer is not only joy, sometimes it's agony. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and it takes the full range of our life and our emotions. And, and that is uh, uh, fine. And that's part of our human experience. God reaches down to us and tries to lift us up to higher levels of, of, of spiritual life. Mm -hmm. And also the, the element of, of connection with other people, the, the, element of communal, the element of going beyond yourself and reaching out, is clear also in the understanding that a good criterion, if there is, a good criterion of a good prayer is if after the prayer you return to the people feeling more connected with them. I mean, regardless of what you did with God, mm -hmm. can you come after that return to your life, to your people around you more connected? That's a point that the prayer was good on, in terms of, of our own human so that's important. And the other thing that Father Theodore mentioned, we have in the Epistle to the Romans in chapter 8, when Paul says that actually we don't know how to pray, and it is the Holy Spirit that prays with us and for us with sighs impossible to express. That, that, that shows the aspect of no matter what we do and how we extend, finally we might not be able to, to, to express ourselves properly. And it is the Holy Spirit who takes up the thing. And on the other hand, the very same apostle in the same epistle, at the very end, in chapter uh, 15 and 16, he asks the Romans to fight with him in prayers so that his mission in Jerusalem would be successful. And he meant it seriously. This, well, this what aspect of is talking about, right? yeah. 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 Now, what about communal prayer? Uh, and I'm sure it is expressed in many different ways. What interests me is uh, how you can retain the, uh, the, the integrity of it without being influenced by what the next person next to you is doing, whether you're praying aloud, whether you're singing, uh, or whether you are in a huge crowd of people. Can you be alone in public? When a, when a group of people are praying together? Well, perhaps you shouldn't be alone. In other words, you should retain your individuality, if this is, and your, your personal approach, but at the same time, you should be absolutely aware that you are praying in the body of church with the whole body of the believers. Mm -hmm. The communal aspect is very important. This is why, you see, even in, in ancient times and in recent times, in the actual worship of the Orthodox Church, we have 
babies, adult people, old people participating. <laughs> and in spite of the noise that comes sometimes, <laughs> you don't say, well, throw all them out of the church, because it's part, it's their way to express in an alive way the community addressing God. And therefore, this communal aspect is very strong. Very strong, it should be retained all the way, although at the same time, one should not be, and is not, never, lost in a sea of anonymous crowds mm. Uh, forgetting who he or she is. So it's a combination of, of things all the time. When we speak about corporate prayer, possibly we should distinguish it between the prayer of the church, which when we come together to worship, we shouldn't be praying privately. In the main, that's a corporate act of worship. We're praying as brothers and sisters yeah. and children of God. And to distinguish that from prayer in public, if you are in a marketplace or in a stadium or traveling in a plane or a train, uh, a person can pray, but he's never separated from his brothers and sisters or from everyone. And though one may pray privately on a plane, he can also be praying for the pilot and for the fellow passengers, wherever one might be. So it's the element always of the humanity uh, around us, of our, of our brothers and sisters. Let us now go to, to, to fasting. Same, same request on my part, if you could kindly define it uh, uh, for us, fasting, both, both as a physical and a spiritual exercise. Well, if, if you take it historically, uh, and if you go to the Old Testament, and even beyond the Old Testament, because fasting is one of the elemental, fundamental expressions of religious life. And in that sense, fasting is abstaining from food. To the, the, the Hebrew term, this is the, 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 uh, the, uh, the meaning of the Hebrew term, and the Greek term, nistia, as a noun, and nistevo, as a verb, means abstaining from food. Practically, wh practically what happened is that the people didn't have to eat anything until sunset. Mm -hmm. And sunset then, because sunset was the beginning of a new day in the old times, uh, they, the new day started with eating, but the whole day, for the rest of the day, they didn't eat anything. And then we have the, the fasting in, in terms of abstaining from certain types of food, but originally the meaning is abstaining from food. What was the occasion for this uh, expression of religiosity? First, very strong emotional conditions related to our relationship with God, namely, Repentance. We know from the Old Testament, David, for instance, after being confronted with Prophet Nathan for what he did with Bersabe, he repented, and, and part of the expression of repentance was full fasting. So here, fasting is related to... Uh, Not to have what usually one yeah. has, the pleasures of everyday exact. life. Uh, number two, fa fasting was related to uh, conditions of mourning or death of one person in the family, and therefore fasting was accompanying this kind of thing as a condition of, of being uh, totally sad and participating by that way to an event that is an event of sadness. And then thirdly, uh, fasting was related to preparation for major liturgical or sacramental events. For instance, in the Old Testament, people would go and offer a sacrifice. They would go and offer a sacrifice without eating anything, and after the sacrifice, it was a so-called sacramental meal, and they could, so in order to prepare themselves, they would abstain from food. Uh, so you have the, the fasting, especially in the Old Testament, related to these basic conditions. When we come to the New Testament, we have perhaps additional things or variations. And therefore, for very early times, for instance, in the early church, we have fasting related to preparation for baptism. Mm -hmm. You have, again, fasting related to conditions of, of repentance and, and confession. And uh, so, so, so it, is, it, is, it is not, from what I hear you saying, and Father Serenopoulos, tell me if I'm wrong. It is not really a, a sense of sacrificing something, but rather of cleansing, of participating, of, of willingly giving up certain elements of everyday life in order to participate in something that is 
elevated, such as? Well, His Excellency spoke about some elements of the general religious background of fasting, including repentance and feelings of grief uh, and so on, and preparation as well. And I think some of those elements continue in the Christian tradition, Absolutely. but to my mind, there's a real shift in the meaning and purpose of fasting as it develops in the Christian tradition, uh, namely that for one thing, it isn't food in itself that presents us to God. It doesn't make us any more righteous or less righteous whether we eat or we do not need, nor are foods from a Christian point of view clean or unclean. So therefore, fasting as such is not an end in itself. Unlike prayer, which is an end in itself because it gives us communion mm -hmm. with God, fasting is a means to an end. So the person has to ask what is really the, the meaning of fasting. And I remember uh, yeah, one church meaning, father uh, who said that, who, I'm so sorry, I interrupted uh, you. a church father mm -hmm. who said that fasting begins in paradise when God told Adam and Eve not to eat of a particular tree. You can have all the food that you want from all the trees, but do not eat, which he gave as a commandment so that they can recognize, acknowledge his lordship and be obedient to it. But they disobeyed it, of course. So to my mind, the, one of the primary meanings of fasting is self-discipline, self-control, obedience, so that we recognize that our life is not dependent upon food, but is dependent on God. He is the primary source of, of life. So through fasting, we try to remember God and His purposes to acknowledge His Lordship, and through the self-control of what we take in our intake, not only in terms of food, but also drink, to learn how to use things well. And in our consumerist society today, fasting helps us to think about the right use of the things that we have. But the most important of all is to remember God and acknowledge Him to show that we have self-discipline and control of our lives and to remember that He above all is the source of life. Jesus Himself said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now, what are the, how, how people all over the place that, I, that I've known, especially young people say, so how do I fast? Do I go by the book, by what, you know, the calendar tells me this, for Lent, etc., cetera, or, or is it what you just said, that really is a personal, it's a very personal thing, and when we fast, do we mm, eat mm -hmm. not meat, etc., or we just not eat for a while? Well, what Father Theodore said, uh, uh, it deals with the, with the motivations uh, or the, the, the meaning, but this doesn't say, doesn't exclude the need for some specific regulated things. In other words, he didn't mean that therefore fasting is something that is totally arbitrary left with the discretion of the individual. Fasting also the church, since the church deals with large numbers of people, uh, the church had to make some regulations, and the regulations came very early. Uh, not as external rules imposed in an arbitrary way, but something that will facilitate this deeper understanding. For instance, we have in one of the documents, the early documents of the church, Didache, the book of Didache of the Twelve Apostles, a, a document of the beginning of the second century. We have there the injunction that do not fast on Monday and Thursday as the Jewish people, but fast on Wednesday and Friday. So very early you have, here you have something very clear, that fasting is a nice thing to happen on Wednesday and Friday. Now, what exactly we would do, that's another story, but, but the basic thing is that you have this type of fasting, or you have the, uh, and we are uh, the Holy Week, very early on, we have a full week before Easter as a time for fasting in order to prepare for Easter. So there are elements like that which then developed more and more. Now we have the Lenten period, which is much more extensive. So what happens there is that you have some set rules there, but we shouldn't forget what Father Ted emphasized, namely, this is not to have a slavishly followed set of right. rules, but an inner disposition of self-control and simply changing everything for God. That's, that's the point. Right. If I may add a word to that, Yanni. Mm -hmm. The church 
does provide us with the rules about a different diet during fasting periods, including Wednesdays and Fridays, the Great Lent, the fasting period that we have in the first 15 days of August and another period so from a rich and festive diet of meats and milk and egg products to a more simple vegetable and grain diet. So there is a basic shift of diet in fasting. Of course, fasting also includes eating sparingly because if a person stuffs themselves with, <laughs> what's, uh, the uh, what's the point? Yeah, okay. no, no, so no. the church does provide to us a structure within which to fast. On the other hand, it's not the legalistic aspect. Uh, we have a certain amount of freedom to think through and as, uh, adopt some uh, discipline of fasting for ourselves and keep it. Uh, it might sound to you humorous, humorous but uh, when I come to uh, the Great Land period, one of the things that I fast for, from is a fasting food, namely popcorn. I happen to be a lover of popcorn. So you don't have it. But I have to show self-control over it that I don't live by popcorn, I live by the <laughs> Word of God. Also, there is a possibility that the spiritual father could has the authority, so to say, uh, depending on the cases, because you deal with, with problems of health, health to somehow offer adjustments Adjustment. of the basic things. And there, is, there are specific rules, and there is even a canon, a rule, which has a very clear sentence in the original, imitis the asthenian somatikin embodizito. You do this and that unless you are prevented by a bodily disease or a, a problem of health. So it's something that, that the church takes into account all the time. No. Yeah. One should mention also, Yanni, as you said earlier, that part of fasting is spiritual fasting, namely to fast from sin and evil because it doesn't do very much good spiritually to be fasting for meat and to run down your neighbor or condemn people. Uh, yes, hypocrite, it, it, very hypocritical, of course. Of course. So. And that's why, my next question, that's why the two, prayer and fasting, are linked quite a lot. And, and could you tell us about that by either of you? And could you give us the scriptural basis, for instance, as you mentioned uh, in, uh, in another discussion? We, we, we have a the, number of things. Yeah. I could start with that. We have a number of things here in which the two realities, meanings and terms, prayer and fasting, go together. Uh, this happens, for instance, in almost all of the Synoptic Gospels, namely Mark, God, uh, Matthew and Luke. Uh, uh, Jesus Christ says this species of demons cannot be expelled but with prayer and fasting. Uh, which means that the two somehow go together for very important moments or events or facts within the religious life. Or you have in the book of Acts, uh, when the church there, the early church, prepares to send to the missionary work and elect some people for offices, we have again, they have, having prayed and fasting, they decided, elected, decided. So we have, in other words, very clear indications of the two being together in view of significant spiritual events or in view of very serious and responsible assignments within the church. Here is an immediate connection, but Father Ted could perhaps have some other sure. passages in mind. Both prayer and fasting are ways in which we seek to focus upon God. It takes some special effort, some special concentration and they naturally fall together because as we said earlier, the primary purpose of fasting is to remind us to create in our hearts a remembrance of God mm -hmm. that He is the Lord and we are His servants and we are thankful that we have all His blessings and use them rightly. And through prayer, uh, we seek as in a personal way to enter into His presence. Uh, mentioning the Gospels, I'm reminded of the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus connects not only prayer and fasting, but also almsgiving. Uh, almsgiving is a key word for doing loving words, works, good works to other people. And this reminds us, of course, that uh, the totality of Christian life is not narrowed to prayer and fasting. Uh, it's also doing good things. So when Great Lent comes around, Christians are not just to focus in their own personal prayers or corporate prayers or fasting, but there's a world out there that needs help. 
that needs our solidarity and our support. Mm -hmm. And therefore, fasting and prayer should be connected also with Christian living in the larger sense. And that way, the whole of life is integrated uh, in the presence of God. Yeah. You are describing a, 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 what is, has come to be the term holistic uh, uh, approach. I mean, we can't, one of these dimensions alone does not make it a spiritual dimension if it is not accompanied by, by the rest of them. Um, then people talk about, oh, we only have two minutes, I understand, uh, levels of fasting. What does that mean, different levels of fasting? Grace, you want well, to now if, uh, you, might, you might have here a differentiation in terms of abstaining from foods. A first level is to just abstain from meat and dairy products and eggs. You go a bit more and you abstain from fish. A third level is you abstain from uh, olive oil and any oil, and you, oil you, you, you could have cooked vegetables, in other words. And there is a fourth element, which happens in some of the monastic communities in Mount Athos, known as xerophagia, literally meaning dry things eating, which means just bread and nuts. Mm -hmm. So what happens here is a, a gradual kind of increasing the abstention from foods that are uh, fortifying and strong and going to something which is simpler. And uh, th that also has to do, shows the possibilities and the variety here. In other words, it shows the wisdom of the church not to have something that is in a way a uniform thing applicable to everybody, but something that is uh, really susceptible to personal adaptations and uh, accordingly arranging your own religious life. Forgive me for having to stop it uh, right now, but we will revisit. This is just a beginning, so if you bear with us. You have been watching Holy Cross Live. I'm Yanis Simonidis for Illuminations. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>